This is Important Stuff for you to know. Welcome to the show. This is Tony. And this is Javier. This is the show where we talk about what we believe may be important stuff. But in the end, it's for you to decide. Welcome back, everybody. I want to put a small disclaimer on the front of this show. Uh, when we recorded this show, I was in Venezuela, out of the country, and we recorded on the internet. Javier was in Florida. And there is some, uh, we pick up an occasional uh, interference background noise that I want to apologize for immediately, because it's a very important show that we wanted to do on inflation. And one of the reasons I was in Venezuela experiencing and observing the inflation, the runaway inflation, the highest rate in the world, certainly in South America. And it's a very important show that we have. Please forgive the interference technology. Uh, we weren't able to capture it completely. And the show will be upcoming. Thanks for listening, folks. Welcome back, everybody. Javier, I have a great topic for you this afternoon. Uh, probably a little academic, but we want to try to break it down into simple terms. Inflation. Complicated. But do you think we can break that down to everyday terminology so that consumers can understand what we mean? Well, we'll try. Uh, but remember, inflation is a very complicated topic. Uh, it has a lot of implications, but certainly it should be of interest to everybody because inflation affects everybody who lives, especially here in the U.S. Perfect. I, I mean, I guess what it breaks down to and what it comes to is every day you take out of your pocket or your wallet or your purse a $1 bill. How much can that $1 bill buy? Some days it's more, some days it's less. Why is that? Tell us a little bit about supply and demand. That sounds complicated by itself. Can you break that down for us? Well, yeah, initially, uh, we have to uh, clarify that, uh, you know, you said how much the dollar buys. That's a purchasing power. Yes. Okay, how much you can buy with a dollar. Uh, second is that you're talking about inflation uh, and how does that affect all the markets. Uh, people think that inflation only affects the, pri the price of goods and services, but actually it affects every market. There's, it has an implication. It's a, there's a ripple effect. The, every time that you artificially touch an economic variable, it affects all the markets. It's like dropping a, a, a pebble on a lake, even if it's like Michigan. The whole lake is going to rise. Ah, give, give me an example. Give me a quick example. Uh, tomatoes. Uh, producer of tomatoes is uh, he's farming, he's paying labor costs, he's transporting, and suddenly there's an event in the Middle East that uh, possibly over a period of time could develop into a real conflict and could affect the price of crude oil. Hasn't occurred yet but possibly could. What's that ripple effect? Well, it's going to affect, at the end, it's going to affect the consumer and everything in, in the distribution channel uh, because uh, tomatoes have to be transported across the country, either by plane, by, uh, by trucks, uh, to uh, markets are far away, and that implies a transportation cost, uh, fuel in this case initially, but eventually it will be everything that is made of plastic, because plastic is made of, uh, of uh, hydrocarbons, is made of whatever, oil, eventually, uh, polymers. So the, a, raise, uh, a raise in the price of oil on the expected price, because what happens is that people have expectations that the price is going to rise. Not only, not only that the price has risen, but people have expectations that in the near future, the price of oil is going to go up. So the price of gasoline or fuel goes up because of expectations. Uh, and the transportation cost of the tomatoes goes up. And the, in the distribution chain, everybody in the chains, all the way up to the retailer who is selling the tomatoes at the grocery store, are going to see that the price that they had to pay for those tomatoes 
before they sell it to the final consumer has risen. So, so uh, they have to adjust the price, the uh, retail price. If, if Let's make it practical here so we can understand more clearly. If the crude oil price goes up 10% because of a possible conflict and the, the, the price is affected, the cost is affected all the way through, does that mean that the, the cost, the price of that tomato will be increased by 10%? Is that 10% inflation? No, well, it, will not, it shouldn't. Uh, and if, happens, if that happens, then that's speculation. Because the, the, the cost of fuel, of gas, uh, in, in transportation, it's only one small part or big part, I don't know exactly, depending on the product, uh, of the cost of those goods when they reach the retailer. But you have to have labor. I mean, there are many components in the cost of goods that will not be affected by the rise, the, the rise in the price of oil. So it's not 10% uh, increase in price of fuel is going to affect 10% the price of tomatoes. No, no, no. It would it would have to be less, a lot less. Okay. Okay, but there is an effect. Okay, there's a direct effect. That brings me to two points I want you to clarify here. One is about the price of gasoline because that hits consumers right in the pocket. Let's, let's go with that one first. The other one I want to cover is the effect that inflation has on jobs and employment. So, first, let's talk about uh, the price of gasoline. In that same scenario, a conflict overseas, the potential of something happening, suddenly the price is going up, and at the pump you see the price of gasoline increasing. And what I commonly hear every day, and I'm a consumer every day, uh, like most of us, these oil companies are making simply too much money. It's a crime. They're making too much money. Are they? Well, they may be. They may be making some money. Uh, of course, there's always room for speculation in, in, in all the markets. Uh, I don't know. I'm not an expert on the oil uh, or the gasoline market. But what happens is that we have to look at the composition okay, of the price of oil uh, at the pump or gasoline at the pump. Because I understand that there are taxes, that a lot of taxes involved. It, that the price, the final price that the consumer pays at the pump, mm-hmm. or the or the uh, or the price that is paid to the to the oil companies, there is a large component of taxes, mm-hmm. federal taxes and local taxes that are, are imposed on them, uh, that, that are collected from the oil companies for. Uh, infrastructure for roads or for whatever. So I don't know exactly how, how, but I understand that they could be pretty high, especially in some states. So it doesn't mean that by just raising the price of oil because some event occurred overseas that the oil companies are benefiting. They may be. They may be. And if they're smart enough and they have been playing in the futures market, they could benefit from that. But uh, it's not just them. Everybody everybody's going to be affected in a negative way. Uh, except probably the producers and maybe even the producers because for some reason they have to raise the price of oil They're in a war or I don't know so n- everything that you do and, and this is something that we have to keep in mind the consumer and uh, we all of us have to keep in mind that in economics when you change one variable for any reason whether it's a natural cause it could be a, a disaster it could be a war it could be government intervention in a specific market Again, remember the pebble effect. Everything is going to be so affected. These are the artificial interventions that you talk about in well, the no, economics. They, they are some of them. Uh, they could be natural ones. Well, well, okay. well, give me an example of an artificial intervention so we can understand the terminology here better. What would be an artificial intervention? Uh, minimum wage, for example. That, w- that would be one in the labor market that affects everything else. Let's say... Uh, that the uh, the government decides to uh, raise the uh, minimum wage. Let's say it raises it uh, to ten dollars an hour. Okay. Uh, that sounds like uh, a good thing. It puts more money oh, in make, the consumer's yeah, pocket. It's going to make people very happy because now they have. They, they at the end of the week they will be paid more money. 
uh, we're at the end of the month or whatever. So it, it's, it initially you would say, wow, that's, that's great because now I won't have more money. But what happens actually? Okay, you're benefiting, initially you're benefiting the consumer. Now what happens at, at the first contact point of the consumer uh, with, uh, let's say, uh, going to a store and that the price, the price has, sees that the price has risen from, from last week. And why is that? Well, because the retailer now has to pay more for its employees. And when it looks at the composition, uh, at, at its income statement, okay, a profit or loss, and then it says, wow, I'm, I'm going to be making less money, so I have to raise the price of the goods that I'm, be, that I'm selling here at the store. So the initial benefit that, it was, that was given to the consumer by raising his uh, wage, his minimum wage, it's going to go away every time that they go and see that the prices of everything they consume has been going up. Because companies have to adjust the prices every time, you know, the, 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 an artificial intervention on the price that they have to pay their employees uh, takes place. So we see that, uh, like, again, is by, by intervening artificially in a specific market, it's going to have an impact in, in other markets. Now, you raise the, the minimum wage to $10. Um, I was just talking about consumer spending, but what is going to happen to uh, companies that are thinking of opening up new stores? And this is how we can tie inflation to jobs. What is the effect well, yes, on well, jobs? Well, what happens in this case, uh, you know, the government decided to raise the minimum wage because of inflation. Uh, maybe that inflation was actually uh, created by the government. It could be, or by a foreign uh, uh, situation. The event, w- event, yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. So the companies now have to pay more for the employees, for labor. And they say, well, maybe I cannot afford to pay the, you know, 30% more to, an, to uh, an employee. So I'm not going to hire anybody anymore. Or I'm going to let go some people. Uh, or I will not be opening a store under these conditions because salary has gone up. So now we see an impact on the labor market. People are, companies are not going to be hiring. There will be some people let you know, out without a job, uh, and when initially they were very happy because they w- they would be get paid more by the hour, but now they will not be paid. Mm-hmm. And I'm I'm laughing not because it makes me it's it's a you know it's 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 a humor, but it's it's a reality that people thought that they were going to be making more money, and eventually they end up without a job. So their intent is good, but the net effect can be and usually is very negative and why is that because they're only looking at one part or they're not thinking it through or what how do they get to this negative effect well number one i and i think that one one of the uh, the reasons is that when when people uh, you know we all make make a, every time we make a decision a spending decision or an investment decision uh, no matter how small it is we look at the cost benefit if, if you have to pay $10 for a bag of, of, uh, of chips, mm-hmm. would you pay it? No, Pro- because the benef- not, yeah. no, because you say the benefit that I'm going to uh, receive from uh, eating the chips and so on, that do not justify paying $10. So everything, everybody makes a cost-benefit analysis. Now, the difference is that when you look at the government versus the individual or versus the corporations, in the case of corporations and individuals, you look at an economic cost versus a benefit that can be defined also in, in economic terms, mm-hmm. in a way. When you look at governments, when you look at bureaucracies, everywhere, not, uh, not just in the U.S., everywhere, they look at the, at the social, quote-unquote, and electoral benefit, not at how much it's going to cost. So the, the uh, economic cost of the, the, the measures or the political decisions are not taken into account. So they, they, they really don't have stockholders they're responsible for. Well, mm-hmm. they should have. Because should. The stockholders is the people who elected them mm-hmm. in, in the nation. But that, unfortunately, doesn't happen in, in, in many places in the world. And I'm not going to pinpoint countries or governments. I'm saying that, you know, that happens. That happens. Uh, that frequently happens where decisions are made only looking at a short-term benefit, which could be political, electoral, 
and, or social. And I'm not saying that they're all bad, in, you know, they're, they're, they're ill intentions on mm -hmm. doing that. All I'm saying that they have an effect. Okay, so I, I, let's try to better understand this explanation that we're going through so we don't confuse people. Is there a perfect balance between the supply and the demand, which would keep prices from going up or down? Is there a perfect without artificial intervention? Well, this is, this is a discussion that has been going around uh, economists and philosophers for a long time. Is there such a price? Is, that's called the equilibrium price. Is there, a, is there a, a price where both supply and demand are at equilibrium? Uh, that everything that is demanded of a specific good is satisfied by companies that are producing enough that people are buying that good. So the, it, the production curve, it's an equi the, the produ production line is in equilibrium, the supply line, and the demand line also, it's in equilibrium. That, well, they fit, they establish a price that everybody's willing to pay and the companies are willing to charge. So people have enough money to buy that product and there is enough production of that product for the demand. That, every, that everybody's satisfied. Let's, let's break it down even further. Milk mm -hmm. or bread. Choose one. Pretty essential products in the marketplace. I have seen the price of milk steadily increase over the last four or five years tremendously what could be causing that type of an effect obviously we're not consuming more are we they haven't well, reduced well, the production well, we're consuming more of course because of population growth there's more people you know, being born every day every hour every minute every second and you know they have to be fed with milk so there is a population increase, but, it, but then in reality, or in theory, if, if, if people, uh, the population grows, then also cattle should be growing to satisfy the demand for milk. Mm -hmm. But what happens is that, and we see that many times, and it's happened in the last, in the last five years uh, or three years, that the, the, the price of, of milk went, up, went through the roof because there were some natural disasters in New Zealand. Uh, in other places of the world, uh, th there was a, 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 a you know I don't know a, we had the, the bad cows and uh, although that affected was the meat market. Yeah. But we have prices of going up and down of day of dairy products, and uh, then the, the if the price uh, if the supply uh, is, uh, is is reduced, obviously the price of that good has to go up. The production of, of milk goes down. Its price will go up because people will be demanding more of a good that is being produced less. So the price will be going up. More people or the same people are bidding for this, for a lower, a lesser quantity of that product. So the price goes up. Yeah, you know, I, I, I've heard also the term uh, thrown about here in the United States about excessive spending. The American population went through a decade of excess in the United What effect does that have on inflation and economics? People go out and buy what they want to buy. Well, they buy more. I mean, if you put more money in people's pockets because of a growing economy, uh, they're going to be spending more. Now, in theory, the more they spend, the more companies will, will produce more products to satisfy that demand. So if production keeps pace with demand uh, the price again talking about the equilibrium price yeah. should stay about the same and it sounds good for jobs because it sounds it, like jobs yes, are yes, staying. yes but the price of the price uh, that you're paid you know the salary the minimum wage should stay the same because if you have more demand and you produce more to satisfy that demand everybody's going to be happy okay companies are making more money and people are, are spending more in the goods that they want that's the that's an ideal scenario that is utopian. It doesn't happen that way, okay? Because when you put money on people's pockets and they go to demand, companies cannot adapt immediately to produce more goods. Some goods will take longer to produce, so there will be 
more demand of, like I said before, there will be more demand on a specific product short term that would push the price up, and that's inflation. Now, the question that you have to ask yourself is the following. How can you put more money in people's pockets? Uh, if, if it is because of, uh, of economic growth, for example, a sporting, a country which, whose economy is fundamentally uh, due to exports, uh -huh. Okay, so the company, the country is, is selling more, it's exporting more, everybody is getting uh, jobs, everybody's getting paid, companies are making money, so the economy is growing, people are getting uh, wealthier, they have more money to spend. Sounds healthy, it's new yes. money, new capital. Exactly, now that could also happen where artificially people get more money in their pockets. And you will say, how? Well, I would just talked about one about uh, uh, wages now what there are other ways where you have artificial intervention uh, you could be printing more money okay the government could be printing more money putting more money in circulation doesn't sound like a good option though is that a good choice in well it's some and sometimes uh, and some economists think it's good it uh, seems it uh, seems as though you devalue a currency when you print more artificially. Well, it, it will eventually happen, but if you have an economy that is in crisis, sometimes you have to put more money in circulation so that people have more spending uh -huh. uh, capacity. They buy more goods, and if the, the, uh, the private sector can recuperate mm -hmm. by producing more because they, they see that people are spending. So it's always a balance. And when any time we look at the, at, the, at the economy of any country, you have to look at the balance of supply and demand. It mm -hmm. happens everywhere. It happens in real estate. It happens when you buy cars. It happens on anything that you do. You, you have to look at the supply. It happens especially in commodities like mm -hmm. milk, you know, uh, orange juice, uh, sugar, corn. You have to look at the supply and demand, and there are experts who anticipate what the supply or the demand can be, and they adjust accordingly. The consumer normally is left behind. Uh, they only react to the impact after the fact. Ah, so the consumer lags. The, yes, because the of knowledge. Lags. They don't have, they don't have the, no, the immediate knowledge of what is happening in the markets. We find out about, for example, there is an overproduction of soybeans in Brazil. We didn't know that, and, and the price of, of, of soybeans goes down. Mm -hmm. But um, what happened? Well, we didn't know that it happened in Brazil, but it could be the opposite, where you have uh, you know, uh, uh, a typhoon in somewhere in Asia that affects the price. Somebody, another country that produces soybeans, and the price goes up. And it's beyond our control and our immediate knowledge. We just have to react to what the market is, is, is setting how about something that is more direct to all of us and affects our pocketbook? Uh, taxes, personal income taxes, not, not sales taxes or use taxes, but personal income tax. What are the effects when tax rates increase? A lot of, a lot of times politicians, uh, they tend to be benefit-driven. They don't look at a true economic picture. They, they look at the benefit for votes many times. It doesn't matter what party they're in. Taxes are increased. What's the effect on a consumer when taxes are increased? And then what's the effect when taxes are decreased? What are the potential well, effects? Well, again, we have to look at, 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 at the overall economy, at all the markets. Uh, for example, uh, one of the first things that happens is that if you – we're talking about corporate taxes or we're talking uh, about individual? Let's look at personal taxes, okay. individual. What happens is that you're, uh, you're actually going to have less discretion or income. You, you will have less money to spend. So you will be consuming less of certain – products that, that you used to consume when the taxes were lower. So you have, Im immediately, you have a shift in the demand curve. People are going to be demanding less of a product. So, so yeah, maybe less vacations, uh, buying less clothing. Exactly. And that, when, when that happens, uh, and remember the, the, the supply and demand curve in the clear, what happens is that if people demand less, the price is going to go down. Companies, companies will not be producing as many items 
because people are not buying as many. So eventually, they may, they may have to let go some people, they may have to close down some factories, they may have to uh, reduce some shifts. So you see the impact. Negative impact. So Again, but, but, but the politicians who initially thought that by raising taxes, it would be beneficial to the overall economy, uh, they didn't look at, at, the, at the overall impact. So they're looking to bring more revenue into, an, into a government so they can distribute it out through social benefits of some sort. But you're assuming, uh, uh, here, here's an assumption that is always made by both sides, is that you're assuming that the government is more efficient and effective in spending money. Okay, than, I'm than not the, assuming than that. the individual. No, I'm yeah, saying. Yeah, I don't I'm, know I'm who. Saying, I don't care who's I'm, in I'm power. I'm saying that right. in this discussion, when you're you're taking money yes. from the individual, yes. and giving it to the government, you're assuming that that money is going to be invested in a way that it will be more beneficial to everybody. Yes. Now, this is an, a discussion, a conversation that uh, uh, it's not. Uh, we don't, we're not going to have enough time. Right, to, that's right. not enough. But let's talk about the impact of reducing them income taxes what is the potential i realize nothing is perfect or absolute but what's the potential if income taxes are reduced well to you an individual? well again you, you affect the discretionary income of the individual so they will be spending more now in a market where there's no uh, external intervention artificial intervention they will be demanding more and the prices of, of some goods uh, that are elastic uh, in other words, that they, if the price goes down, people will buy more. That's what is called price elasticity. Mm -hmm. uh, what happens is that they, they will be demanding more goods, so the companies are going to say, wow, you know, I'm selling more than, than I had expected, so we have to produce more, and we, we don't have enough shifts, so we have to increase shifts so that we can satisfy the increase in demand. They have to go out and hire more people. And eventually... If there are not enough people ready to work for them because they're in another industry, they are going to have to get, give some incentives, some additional benefits, maybe even higher salaries, minimum wages, to attract workers to that sector. So you could see that, and here it, it gets more complicated because you could see that some sectors are benefiting even more than other ones, depending on, on the on the demand of those products. Yes. So they, you have an effect all across the economy that people don't realize. Now, is this possible? Raise the question as you were just explaining this. So you reduce taxes to put more disposable income into a consumer's pocket. Their demand grows because they go out and, and use and purchase. They consume more products and services. Doesn't that increase of demand actually cause inflation? Oh, yes. It causes it to go up. Is yeah. that a good thing well, or a bad thing? Yes, because there may be, a, uh, like I said, there may be a lag. Uh, uh, there may, you know, there is always a lag between the immediate increase of demand because people have more disposable income and the ability, uh, the capacity of corporations to produce adequate goods so that the price remains at the equilibrium level. But now look at this. We're only we're only concentrating on one side of the economy. Mm -hmm. We're not looking at what happens with with the federal government or the state governments by reducing the state federal taxes. They want to have less revenue. So a lot of the, the the programs that are being financed by the government will not eventually have sufficient funds. Okay, maybe infrastructure, uh, education, uh, health, and so on. So the point is that you have to strike a, a, a balance, and I, I would not say perfect because this all perfect is not a word that you can use in economics or in, a, in, in politics and government, but you have to try to reach, to find an adequate balance where your uh, political and economic decisions do not affect the, the private sector because then you, have, you may have end up with a zero sum game nobody's getting any benefit because whatever is people are getting benefit from programs in like welfare and so on you're be ta you're taken away because of inflation on the other side so you have to you always have to have a very wide perspective when you make decisions and especially 
when the, the you know the government is making because the impact of a government decision is it's great. It's, uh, you can imagine it's affecting the the, yes, the overall economy. That's everybody. So, I, I guess economics is not an exact science like mathematics it's uh i think you use the term elasticity mm-hmm. uh, yeah i apologize because I, i didn't explain that but eventually i, I would encourage people to look at, at elasticity of demand and supply uh, but we actually talked about them in this conversation yes because uh, you know companies com- if companies can really respond very rapidly to demand Uh, that shows that companies, you know, are, are adaptable to any change in in the, in the demand curve by, by the public. So, the prices that would adjust or not. Uh, so this is a, this is one of those terms that are used commonly. If you look at the news, uh, listen to the news, you will see people talking about elasticity. There are many terms that, uh, if if you hear them often enough, I would encourage people to go and look at. Them. They're not that complicated. Economics, it's not a. Uh, such a complicated science it, it impacts everybody and people should have a, a, a basic fundamental knowledge of, of, of things to know how their lives can be impacted by decisions by companies by uh, communities by the government I, I think people probably the consumer the average consumer probably has a very good understanding of economics that they don't even realize exactly. because they buy products every day they know that if the bread By instinct yes that if they if the bread that they buy is 25 cents more this week than it was last week they're learning about economics because it's disposable income in the household and supply and demand the 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 effect on the price of products. So getting more in wages doesn't always mean it's a good thing for prices. Because Maybe short term it is. And I, I'm not saying that wages should not go up. I mean, it all depends on the uh, on what economic cycle you're in. Mm-hmm. But eventually, eventually, if you let the markets, and, and, and you can tell that I'm, I'm pro uh, market, uh, mm-hmm. I think the market, uh, you know, the invisible hand of, of uh, Adam Smith uh-huh. uh, works. If you let the market work its way, probably sooner you could reach a, a, a an equilibrium point a mm-hmm. where supply and demand meet and everybody is sort of happy, uh, somewhat happy. Uh, so uh, I I do believe in the market, uh, definitely yes. Great, great. I that's probably a good place to leave it because that leads me to a perfect market. Probably needs some regulation. That's probably a topic we need to address in the future. But this is a good place to wrap it up. Why don't oh, we pause? You cannot do that to me. No, <laughs> you just touch. A, a, oh, you touch a very sensible point here. People. And you do. You talk about we need more regulation. Uh, actually, I think that regulation has been in place already in many, many markets, in many, many cases, instances. It's supervision that is not effective. Ah. You, you can have you can have the best regulation in the world. We had we had plenty of uh, regulations in, here in the U.S. Uh, in uh, let's say for example in the financial sector I think it was laxed supervision uh, and control mm-hmm. what brought us to the crisis in 2008 yeah. there was I, you know with the regulations that we have uh, in that market or they have in that market if if uh, if the, uh, the government the institutions that supervise the financial market which are a few of them had they applied uh, what the regulations were telling them you know in terms of controls and supervision maybe we would not have that that uh, I'm not saying that we I'm saying maybe the financial crisis the mortgage crisis would not have taken place in 2008 I think we're we're venturing into a whole different topic here that needs a lot of explanation so on that point let's take a short break and we'll be right back with you after the short break
Welcome back, everybody. Javier, this is a segment that we get a lot of feedback on or suggestions. This is important stuff. Or is it? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to let you decide. Around the world, around the country, we have a lot of warning labels. We have a lot of signs. Let me throw a few out. Okay, here's a good one, Javier. On a toilet cleaning brush, where you make sure the toilet is sanitized and clean and you scrub it, a brush has a little container there that it's held in. Yeah, the ones that you put in the side. Yes, I put okay. them on the side. There's okay. a little warning label on the brush. It uh -huh. says, do not use orally. Wow. That could be important. Okay, which end of, which end of the brush are they talking about? Well, they don't specify. It just says, do not the use it The one that has the bristles? Is that I would imagine. Maybe people need an extra toothbrush. They forgot theirs when they were traveling. So They have to specify. Yeah. I mean, I think it's not important because it's not very well written. They have to say, do not put in your mouth mm -hmm. the side with the bristle. Ah. Because... On the other side, there may be people, you know, there's a lot of weird people around. Yeah. And they may want to use the other side. Could be. For Could. other purposes. So this one's not well written, you know. No. Think. No. It's not specific. Need to be more specific. It, exactly, yeah. Besides, who can get that brush? I mean, how can you put it, get it in your mouth? I, I guess they are pliable. They give way. I don't know. Some people have a big mouth. They should say, they should say beware because... It would create uh, bad breath or halitosis. It could. Yeah. It could. Yeah. On an, we have to find out the brush. manufacturer. Maybe we should drop in a letter to them or an email. Uh, be more be specific. Be more specific. Yes. yes. All right, here's one that was made very popular by the Harry Potter character. Harry Potter with all the wizardry. So popular. And they flew on brooms all the time. So... You now they have children's products. Now the children are all excited. It's a Harry Potter broom. The warning label says this broom does not actually fly. That could be important. So that's they're they're telling the kids. Probably it's for the kids, no? I would guess the kids, unless it's the parents they're giving information to to inform the parents. Well, you don't have to be concerned because your kids won't be able to, your children won't be able to fly on this broom. So no helmet would be necessary. You've had kids, right? Yes. Okay. Did you ever see one of your kids go into the closet to get a broom for any purpose at all? Uh, they don't even know where the brooms are. I mean, anything that has to do with work. Not at all. Housework. They will, not, they will not get close to the, close to the closet where you keep the brooms, right? So uh, number two, even though they saw it in the movie, they write. Uh, you know, I I, think, I always thought that it's very difficult to keep balance when you're flying in a broom. Mm, maybe that's what why keeps, they don't huh? fly. Maybe that's why they don't make it to fly. They difficult to I keep mean, the balance. Imagine they don't have wings, so uh, I'm sure kids know from from when they're little that even the paper airplanes need the wings, unless they use the legs as wings, and you know you spread open your legs and you and you fly in the room, but that would give air resistance. Imagine flying on a on a broom with your legs open. Hmm. I think it's obvious that they will not be used for flying. Okay. Besides, the, I mean, if, you, if you're going to fly it, where, I mean, if you take it out of the closet and you try to fly with it, you're going to fly indoors and you're going to hit the wall. Yeah. So very soon you're going to know. It doesn't fly. No. Yeah, I don't think it's important. Well, Javier, we've come to the end of the show. We certainly had a good time, and we hope our listeners did too. Maybe along the way someone even learned something. And remember... If you think something is important stuff, let us know and we will talk about it. So, until next time, hasta, hasta la vista. vista.